This scientist says he's haunted by the, by the figures of all the mothers who are dying every day while he can't change the world. Yeah. So for those of our readers who might not have encountered Dr. Semmelweis before, who was he and, and what was it about his life story that drew you to him and made you want to put his, his life on stage? So essentially, Semmelweis worked out um, a way of stopping what we now call sepsis, which was then called uh, childbed fever or porperic fever being spread in the maternity wards of the hospital where he was working by working out that there was a connection between the fact that the medical students were dissecting cadavers um, and then going straight into examining the women patients without any systematic form of hygiene. And this was in Vienna in the 1840s, Vienna in the 1840s, right? 1840s, yeah. 1840s, yeah. 1840s yeah. 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 And, and he worked out that there must be something on the hands of the doctors, this is the, what the play explores, how he did this, um, that was being carried into the wards where the women were being treated. But he couldn't see it, he didn't know what it was, and he invented, his first idea was to call these things cadaveric particles, corpse particles. Hmm. But the fascinating thing is that he knew that his findings showed that something was travelling from the corpses to the women, and he knew that dipping everyone's hands in chlorine stopped the disease spreading, but he couldn't say what the particles were, he couldn't see them, hmm. couldn't explain why it worked, just he knew that it did work. And that's a kind of fascinating dilemma. What happens if you know something but you can't explain why? We're doing this play because Mark said, I've got a story I really want to work out how to tell in a theatre, and it's a story of this man. And he told me the story, and I got very interested. So, so. Yeah, it was very unusual and nice for a director to ask an actor. But Tom thought this one was interesting. And, and it, it, the book I had read before I met Stephen was a book by Celine, um, <clears throat> The Surrealist, because I liked reading Surrealist stuff, and it was a book called Semmelweis, a very angry book which painted Semmelweis as a victim of stupid authorities. In, in medical science. And we did a workshop on that basis, and Stephen then came and joined the project, and he brought in the more scientific book by Newland, mm -hmm. which showed us a different story, which was that Semmelweis himself was also a contrib contributing factor in the reason, w obviously, why the discovery was made, but also why the discovery was not accepted, which Celine had blamed entirely on the authorities of the time. Uh, but, but so that, then that really became very interesting to yeah. us. Not only how a great discovery is made, but how are they communicated best? Mm. I think there's two parts to the play and two aspects that are at the core of it. Yeah. When I came on board, um, as Mark said, one of the things we did was look at why, why did Semmelweis find it so difficult to get people to agree with him and accept what he'd found. And we, from that first sort of picture of the, the man who was um, uh, brutalised or just blocked by conservative authorities, which was part of the story, um, but then we came up, we started to explore a much more complex sort of view of how he was as a, um, just a difficult personality, who, which in some ways the difficulty or the uh, you know, the, the maverick nature of his personality was partly what enabled him to speak the, an unusual truth, and yet at the same time, that kind of maverick, difficult, argumentative personality then makes him the kind of person who puts people's um, backs up. And so we sort of started to develop this much more complex sense of that, uh, of that character and the whole world around him, that the doctors around him were not just sort of um, complete stuck-in-the-mud fools, but actually were um, in this battle uh, with ignorance and their own fear of the truth. Mm. Um, another big thing we looked at was just how difficult it is for people to accept a new idea when part of the implication of that is um, a dreadful burden of responsibility for themselves because all of these doctors had been delivering hundreds, thousands of babies and uh, with these quite often dreadful death rates. Mm. Uh, and then to sort of for them to say, 
ah, okay, it's all us. And it's incredibly difficult, but, and Samwise himself talked about that burden uh, of guilt. So we, um, we started to develop a much more complex sense of what it might be, what it might be like to be a scientific innovator in that particular environment. And I think I was also, uh, like Tom was saying about, you, you have this sort of, you theorize cadaveric particles and so on, you have this idea there's something. And I always found it really fascinating trying to understand and then convey to the audience what it must be like not to know what germs are. Like one of the most fundamental pieces of knowledge of the modern world. You know, one of the great discoveries in human history, really. And, and obviously there were bits of it before, but actually, you know, this is pre-germ theory. And to be sort of groping in the darkness towards that, um, that also seemed to me a really fascinating uh, historical scientific moment. And, and why do you think, this is addressed to, to all of you, why do you think his theories were so kind of roundly rejected by the establishment at the time? You've touched on maybe some of them, but... The, the fact that um, doctors were killing patients, that, that's always been a hard thing for the medical establishment to swallow. And, but it goes further in Vienna because part of the big surge of scientific progress at the Vienna General Hospital was autopsy. And the mm. pioneer of that process was, is in the play, is a guy called Rokotansky, huge figure in the history of medicine. Mm. And, he, and so everyone was saying, wow, this is amazing. We, if we chop up the bodies and look at them um, in detail, we can trace the, the passage of a disease through the body of the patient after death and work out what it is. Um, and his whole process, um, and Stephen and Mark picked this up in the script beautifully, autopsy means see for yourself. It's about what you can see for yourself and trusting that. Now, as it happens, the fact that all of the medical students were, were taking part in this learning was causing the death rates to go up. Um, and Semmelweis himself, this is another detail in the play, because he was obsessively dissecting the cadavers of, of the patients who died, that even the patients who he was looking after would be more likely to die. Mm. Um, so it cuts right to the heart of the establishment. It's very, very difficult for an establishment to say, yeah, it's us. And one of the things that is investigated in the play is that Semmelweis is prepared to do that even if it's him, mm -hmm. in order to progress the, the, the shared knowledge and progress science. Uh, um, so I think that there, one, of the way, one of the things that we can reflect on now is what are the questions that we're too scared of because of their implications for us, whether they're in science or anything else. And the other thing is, what are the things that, even though we know they're the right thing to do, we don't bother doing? Oh, yeah. mm. Mm. It doesn't apply to me today. Oh, I'm in a hurry. Oh, there's something really urgent coming up and I'm not going to do it today. Or, you know, we know that people shouldn't be drowning in the channel, but oh, we're not quite going to look at that or whatever it is. So there are lots and lots of ways in which the processes of the progression of knowledge, which are dramatised in the writing and on stage, I think resonate for us now. Obviously, women are the kind of at the centre of Dr. Semmelweis's story in their their healthcare. Is there anything that we can say about the role of kind of specifically maternal healthcare and how perhaps that has been an overlooked area of medical science? I mean, obviously, I've got a vested interest in this, but yeah. um, I wonder if there are any kind of modern Mm. lessons we can draw from, from that? I think that definitely part of the story is that um, obstetrics was a lower status yeah. discipline to some extent back then and perhaps that's still a bit true now. I don't know if that's right but certainly back then it was taken seriously and there was you know significant um, scientific work being done on obstetrics all the time in the 19th century um, by some significant figures at the Vienna General, the, the person who was not Semmelweis's boss, who he sort of cl um, clashed with, but his, that man's predecessor was a 
really noted and very successful leader of the maternity clinic, Guy called Boer, um, and was known across Europe for his success and the development of obstetrics. But I think at the same time, um, it, was, it was a lower status uh, area. And although people really, I'm sure that they did really care about these women dying in childbirth at the same time, was there a slight sort of discounting of that? I don't mean total discounting, but you know, it had less weight. Very much um, a partial vision. I mean, look, you're talking to three men that's true now. Too. Yeah. Um, the medical establishment in Vienna was entirely male. Mm -hmm. um, Celine is a man who wrote the first book we read. Newland's a man who, who wrote this other kind of counter arguing book. Mm -hmm. And the whole history is mediated by men, mm -hmm. the one we know. Um, and there is no doubt that there was a, a, a subjugation of female wisdom and experience of childbirth by the medical establishment at this very point of medical progress in the middle of the 19th century, that, that essentially the previously independent, I'm generalizing, but the previously female managed processes of childbirth through mid conventional historical midwifery were being, as it were, colonized by this very male, progressive, objectivizing scientific approach, which is, you know, in, in, encapsulated in autopsy. So we, um, couldn't, we couldn't even, sorry, we couldn't even find a biography of a nurse, yeah. you know. So Stephen rightly cre created a nurse character for our play, and we transferred an event that happened to someone else in the story to a male doctor to her, and that in Bristol was proved one of the most powerful things, mm -hmm. was meeting nurses coming to the play, and they were saying, this, is, this same thing is going on now. Mm -hmm. the, the high percentage of midwives who are, are quitting, I think. And mm -hmm. So, so it, it was mm -hmm. even clear, you can't get to the history of women yeah. in, in these and the difficult And the difficulty she has in having her voice heard yeah. In, yeah. The, in the process, talking to the doctors, saying, oh, well, this is what I'm seeing on the ward. You know, and I'm sure that's still happening today. And um, in the, the fascinating thing is on the stage, there are more women than men in our production. So the play is written overwhelmingly with men speaking, but we have the ghosts, the presences of the women who might have been saved, who are dancers um, and musicians, um, who are in many ways driving the story. Um, and in, in the, as part of the process of creating the production, in other words, the interpretation of the text, um, we've had sessions with all of those women asking them about what their experiences are of medical care now. And of course, you know, this is being covered in the media now. The, the objectivizing of the female body by the male medical establishment is a, vi is a real problem now. Yeah. We still don't hear um, the voices of women, patients, or nurses properly when we're trying to understand what care needs to be and how it needs to develop. So one of the discoveries of the rehearsal process is that, is that this is not a finished conversation. You know, the man, Semmelweis, made his discovery, we're telling that story, and we're telling the story of his, his battle with the establishment, and then uh, in the end, his discovery is, is authenticated by mm -hmm. The research that can prove it, um, but at the same time, the story of the women and the and the fundamental kind of disregard for what their experience of their care is is still alive. And the women in the company will tell you that that is what they're finding in in the way they're playing. Um, and it's sometimes wordless. There are uh, Semmelweis's wife has a lot to say and a through line which connects with this. The dancers don't have a lot to say, but they are in a way that is resonant with the experience of the women in the story that we're telling, and it's a problem. And, and Stephen and Mark, you co-wrote this play, right? So yeah. what was it about his life that made you think this is suited to the stage rather than a book or a film or some other kind of medium? I'm strong willed and strong determined. I had a lot of strong opinions about the structure of the story and, and, about, and about the use of soliloquies and a number of different things in my experience 
uh, that were different. So it was, you, you know, Stephen and I complementary, I hope I can say, that to each other. I'm much more, uh, I'm a little like Sam Advice. People don't always understand what I'm talking about. And I don't always understand what I'm talking about. Stephen's very clear and, and much more studious than I too and accurate about things. I, I, I tend to have an, an instinct about the emotional aspect of a story. Um, uh, and so, you know, Tom, it was really, it wouldn't, I think it was really the essential thing is having a third person, a mediator, um, that, that is encouraging the both of us. So there were times that we had, you know, strong arguments and broke apart and, and time, but I feel now that's all been very, very positive for the project. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I'm sure we both at times felt the other person was being very, very difficult. And so we were experiencing, to some degrees, what some we were... Some self moments. We <laughs> were, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But actually, I hope people will agree, certainly in Bristol, it felt that the play was very powerful. And mm. so I'm interested in collaboration, and collaboration not just amongst people who all agree. Yeah. This thing we're all talking about, the internet, people only listening to sites that they agree with. That it's, so the, but the theatre, it might become a film, who knows, but the, the theatre is... I mean, no film gets a chance a year after you've launched the film to go back in and make the changes that we're making now, which are really profoundly helpful, I think. Don't you? I think we're making yeah. great yeah. headway now. It's a much more creative uh, pr pr place, the theatre, I, I think. I think I would say as well about um, why, why is it a theatre piece? For me, I mean... Um, one test of that is that you read the story or start looking at the story and it starts throwing up scenes and, and they yeah. feel like theatre scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, they have that really powerful kind of dialectical clashes and also there are big, there's a lot of big visual scenes in it and Mark had a very specific idea. I'm not, am I allowed to give away about the dancers? I mean, that was, your, that was you who sort of said from the, before I was on board, Mark was like um, that we... Uh, that we honor bringing... Semmelweis's statement that he's haunted. Yes. This scientist yes. says he's haunted by the by the figures of all the mothers who are dying every day while he can't change the yeah. world. Yeah. So there's sort of big. Yeah, it's a very theatrical show. There's. Uh, um, and to be, what, be sorry, specific on, Tom, about on, that, the um, f theatres a very good language for people to see things that aren't really there. Mm. Um, the um, much much better than film actually yeah. because in a film either something's there or it isn't whereas on stage Mark is able to play we've got two time scales at the same time he's remembering his life in 1847 and he's talking to his wife and one of his colleagues in 1860 at the same time and that means we've got people on stage in a scene who aren't really there so his wife and his colleague are sort of hearing him tell the story, but seeing it at the same time. And also there are the ghosts of the women who he might have saved and hasn't, who are also present on the stage. And theatre goers know how to read these strange multiple presences and they're ambiguous. And the story wants them to be ambiguous because it's about a man who sees things that aren't there, including yeah. the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, so theatre allows us to play with those quite bravely, actually, sometimes counterintuitively, and then we can watch it in a rehearsal room or, or even watch it in a run in Bristol and adjust it when we come to remaking the show now. So there's a lot of freedom in it. Tom brought up a lovely thing too, that of course, theatres in this country were called playhouses. Uh, the the theatre comes from science, doesn't it? From yeah. uh, a place to to behold. Theat yeah. Theatron. Theatron in the Greek. You're mm -hmm. in Greek, Scott. I mean, it is Greek. It yeah. was used in <laughs> in it science was, and medicine. That's right. So it was used for a place of medical exhibition in Britain and in Europe before it became the accepted word for a theatre. So in the 16th century in Britain, theatres were called playhouses. Dissecting rooms already in Europe were called theatres. Um, and then one of the playhouses happened to be called the theatre in East London, and then the, then the term caught on. <laughs> That's a lovely parallel, isn't it, yeah. then, for today's play? Um, and, and I want to get on to, I guess, what's kind of changed in, in this latest production. But just first, Mark, there, you mentioned that um, you feel like there's maybe some similarities between you and, and the character of Dr. Semmelweis. Do you feel any kind of affinity? What 
kind of what kind of connection would you say to do you have to this man from history? I had great difficulty speaking when I was a child. I had to go to speech therapists to learn how to speak. I'd speak very fast and people couldn't understand me. And that seems to be part of his biography. Um, even in his native language, he had a little difficulty with language. But when he moves into the imperial Austrian language that he so admires and respects, these wonderful, he, 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 I think one of the reasons he had difficulty and got frustrated was he couldn't, he couldn't say all the words properly, couldn't put things together as well as, you know, you want to think of England during Queen Victoria's time with the pride that empires have in their language and the importance that people speak correctly. So we've explored that aspect of it. I, I also have a very kind of curious and boundaryless mind, which helps me as an actor, but makes me interested in things that are, are other people don't, are not interested in at all, crop circles, for example. You, you know, so I, I, I'm, I know a lot of people who are on the fringes of an orthodox theory about a matter, the Shakespeare authorship, that kind of thing. So, so those people are of interest to me, how, how, we, how we make better use of them. So you, you know what it's like to be yeah. embattled with the establishment. Yeah, in I know what it's like to <laughs> or, or call the whole RSC company together and have a, have a Baconian authorship skeptic address them because I think they're all going to obviously see the point of this. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, a lot of angry, angry uh, conversations in the green room after that. <laughs> So in a way, you're both sort of radicals, I guess, in your own fields. Oh, well, no, I'm nowhere near what, as Stephen said, this is a fun, this is an extraordinary um, discovery for humanity, not just for the poor mothers, but also for all operations, e e everything. There were other doctors earlier on, uh, Dr. Gordon in Scotland, a uh, small GP, quickly closed down again because of the implications of murder on his fellow doctors. Also the poet Wendell Holmes, um, uh, who, yeah. who started as a doctor, discovered the same thing. So, so there, are, there are little shoots earlier, but Semmelweis actually gets to the place where he can write to every medical institution in Europe, uh, and he's proven that it works, and still they, still they brush it aside. So it is a, it is a really interesting case to study in terms of the need we all have now in society to invent new solutions for energy, for water, for heat, for all the things that we're facing. Mm. We need people who think outside the box. As somebody who writes about the environment and climate change a lot in my day job, are there any learnings we can take from where Semmelweis went wrong about how we kind of communicate the urgency of the issue of climate change and nature loss to to the rest of the public in a way that kind of inspires people to take action. Yeah, funnily enough, Greta Turnberg, I, I did one of these articles where people can send in questions and much to my, my amazement, I got a question from Greta Turnberg, who I've never met, though I admire her. But it, she, her question was, what role does the arts and culture have in the climate and extinction emergency? Um, and I, 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 I think there is only so far that you can protest and point fingers and, con you know, as Semmelweis does, accuse people of things, of murder, of all kinds of things that in some ex environmentalists have a right to say that. We're murdering our children's future. But actually, the ears close and people just stop. It has a counter effect. So I think they're right to be asking us yeah. artists, how, how, you've got to awaken you've got to awaken something else in a person for them to be able to say, yeah, it's me, I need to change. I, mean, I think that we're used to seeing disruptive behavior and consensual behavior as a choice. You, you either do one or the other. And one of the extraordinary things about the way Just Stop Oil are behaving at the mo moment is that they are being disruptive, like some of us, they really are deliberately. Mm. And then whenever Chloe Naldrick gets on the telly, she says, and she's attacked for being disrupted. She says, I'm sorry, but it's the only way I can get on your program for you, for you to ask me the questions you're now asking me, and I have the chance to tell the story that I'm telling and explain why, and then she can be invitational. And, may, and th so for me, the discovery is that Semmelweis in the play is only disruptive. He doesn't switch between the disruptive and the consensual. Mm. But actually what's happening in some parts of the environmental movement now is calculatedly people are doing both. We're going to be really disruptive, make everyone cross, and we get on the news, and then we're going to be incredibly 
open and reasonable and, and reasonable and invite people to consider what we're saying and it's mm. interestingly working mm. it's amazing how many lessons you can draw from one man's life in vienna and, and budapest thank you ever so much for your time everybody really appreciate it and thank you thank you seeing the play hope thank the you. scientists right. will come to the play <laughs> yes yes